into education. We really hope that you guys enjoy this discussion. Uh, and again, we really appreciate that you have come out tonight. So the way that we have this set up is we'll, we'll have about six questions asked. We may do more, we may do less, depending on the amount of time. And each question will last for around 10 minutes. And so we'll, go, we'll start with a question, and then um, it will be more of an organic response. So um, any of you can can respond, start um, the discussion, and then uh, I will let you know when we're at 10 minutes or around 10 minutes, and then we'll move on to the next question. The first question that we're going to start with is, as a faculty member, do you believe that your role is more as a researcher or an educator? Does one of these roles detract from your ability to do the other? How does your role as a researcher enhance or detract from your effectiveness as an educator? And if any of you care to start. <laughs> um, so I'm Rob Kelly. I'm from the engineering school. I was probably supposed to send you something, but I didn't. Um, I guess the way I looked at this question is uh, the answer to the first, do you believe your role is more of a researcher and educator, is yes. The, the difference between teaching in a classroom and doing research is when we do research, neither the instructor nor the student knows the answer. And so I don't, I think they, they work together. The only way my view they detract is that just like everybody else up here, I have 168 hours in my week. And once we take out what my wife tells me to do and my kids tell me to do, um, that's what's left is to spread out amongst the uh, uh, research and teaching. But I don't really see them as uh, in competition except for time. Well, well, I think if I could jump in next, then I'll say I definitely uh, feel just <clears throat> maybe elaborate that on that a little bit in the sense that uh, my experience has been that uh, great scholars are great scholars um, and uh, that frankly uh, the people that are intellectually engaged in the creation of knowledge um, are usually um, not a hundred percent of the time but usually also outstanding in the de dissemination of that knowledge in a way that excites their students and engages uh, their students. Um, I think that, that over the years, some of the best classes that I've ever had um, have been classes where uh, the students have managed to get me off track uh, talking about whatever I was supposed to be talking about that day, to talk about something that I've studied over the years or something that I've read about that was somebody else's research. And I think that that keeps uh, the classroom uh, current and exciting and interesting, and if a scholar is, is not involved in that, then I think they are uh, selling themselves short and selling their students short. I would very much agree with that. In my experience, I think there's a lot of factors that go into effective teaching, but I think the most effective teachers, the most interesting teachers, are those who are passionate about their subjects, have conducted original research, and have subjected themselves to the scrutiny and criticism of their peers. Um, teaching clarifies thinking. A lot of times I think I understand something, something in the literature, I'm speaking a language that is familiar to uh, fellow professors, but if I can't articulate it to students, if I can't break it down, it means I don't understand it very well, actually. And there's nothing that is uh, more uh, uh, stimulating for a professor than a, than a piercing question from a student. Many times I have found a student cut through a lot of academic gobbledygook and sort of ask a very simple question, and then, and then I have to stop and think, well, uh, what is the answer to that? It's also, I think, the case that research reveals that conventional views, even sometimes views stated in textbooks, can be wrong. And at a research university like UVA, learning is really about discovery, and there's no better way uh, to learn than from a faculty member who is herself creating new knowledge. 
So I see this as very complementary, and I think for myself, I suspect for some of, uh, of, of uh, my colleagues, uh, we chose this, this dual career very consciously. If I had wanted only to be a teacher, I would have been a high school teacher, and that would have been a wonderful career path. If I had wanted to only be a researcher of, of public policy, I would have worked in a think tank. I wanted to combine the two because I think the combination is actually synergistic and very exciting. So rather, of course, on any given day, you know, if you're, if you're meeting with a student, you can't be writing an article, and if you're writing an article, you can't uh, be teaching uh, a class. So there can be micro trade-offs, but over the course of your career, I have found the two really reinforce one another. So I'll add another dimension to that, and that this question is set up almost as though the two don't overlap. And that often is the case when we have so many students in large classes and we can't possibly be doing research at the same time as the you're doing the class. But one of the most exciting moments uh, in this career with the combination of research and teaching is when they overlap so completely that they are essentially one. When I work with students in the laboratory on research, on my project, I'm teaching, I'm mentoring, and I'm doing research, and they're doing research and they're teaching, and they're mentoring right back. So the, the absolute ultimate synergy is, is one that I wish we could offer in every subject and to every student from every professor, and our numbers just don't, they're not consistent with that model. But ultimately, that's, I think, what the paradigm ought to be. It ought to be where there is no separation of those two, that, that to be that top-notch scholar and researcher is always learning when we're researching, and so we should be teaching that along at the same time. It's an exciting, exciting moment when you have that aha moment that is both teaching and discovery simultaneously. And I would add to that and say that in the design disciplines, in architecture and in the arts, where the notion of what constitutes research is sometimes a little bit hard to pin down. It doesn't fit into neat academic models often. It's a um, process of uh, discovery and exploration. I think this is also true in creative writing and in other creative fields. But it, you, it is a process of breaking into new territory, unexplored territory, mostly by posing the most interesting questions or the kinds of questions that unlock new lines of exploration um, through design. And in that setting, the in the design education, for instance, as we do in the architecture school, which is very teaching intensive, students and, and, and interaction, it is a, um, the, the line between teaching and research is almost impossible to define because the, the, in a way, it's, there's a kind of equalizer that goes on when there is such a concrete knowledge, but there are, so a lot of the teaching has to do with how one poses questions, how one frames questions, how one uh, opens up this territory, but it is not about the transmission of a given body of knowledge. some real questions about how that model fits into a research university and what constitutes research um, when that line is so blurred because much of the, the university is set up to draw some distinctions between the two. Would anyone else like to add anything? Well, I, just, I would just like to add sort of a PS to all of this. The university through the provost office has this wonderful initiative that I know a lot of us have been involved in like called the Jefferson Public citizens grants and also smaller public service grants and this has been another way I think that faculty have been able to work with students who are creating research projects and I have found this um, very rewarding. I've been lucky enough to have been associated with several of them and it's a nice spillover from the top down if you will to encourage students to take on research projects of their own and to fill out their own IRBs, let me say. <laughs> Great, thank you for your first, um, our first answers to the question. Um, so the second question we have is, how does the idea of a liberal arts education at a research institution influence the university community? 
How does it impact relationships between faculty and students, which you did elaborate on in the last question, um, and then faculty and administrators and um, amongst peers, being students to students and faculty to faculty. And it can be any of those. That's a lot of different. <laughs> a lot of, there are four questions in that. But. Actually, there's books on yes. <laughs> questions. I, I'm just going to start off because um, a lot of times uh, people make a, a very erroneous assumption that because I'm associated with commerce school or business school that somehow um, that we aren't interested in the liberal arts or supportive of the liberal arts. But um, I can say unequivocally that um, I believe that the commerce school is just as much a part of the great liberal arts university as um, the English department or the politics department or anything else. Um, and I can also say that um, I would I would not be at a university um, that doesn't have the model that we use with respect to the undergraduate program in the Commerce School where students spend their first two years typically in the College of Arts and Sciences and then, and then come into the Commerce School. Granted, they spend most of their third year taking Commerce classes, but then the fourth year again have more flexibility to take courses uh, in other parts of the university. And, and the reason for that is that uh, over the years, it has been demonstrated to me over and over again that the most successful, uh, not only business leaders, but, but citizen leaders, are people who have exposed themselves to a wide range of topics, particularly during their, their undergraduate years. Um, I sit on the board of a, of a Fortune 500 company, and routinely we are engaged in issues that involve not just economics and, and business, but but you know politics and history and geography and, and all sorts of things that are uh, essential to a well-rounded, um, great, great, uh, well-educated person. And and just just to sort of put a put a you know highlight on that that idea. Um, uh, several years ago, I was talking to one of our recruiters who had historically recruited uh, students from UVA. And uh, for a couple of years, they decided to recruit students from Wharton, the uh, University of Pennsylvania, which is a four-year business program. And they probably take two or three times as many finance courses and quant courses and things like that than our students actually do. And then they came back and they suddenly started recruiting at UVA again. And I, so I said, why, why, did you, why did you do that? And he said, well, I have a partner that went to Wharton. And he said that he really wanted to recruit at Wharton. And I said, well, then why did you come back? And he said, well, what we discovered was the Wharton kids uh, came in, and they could run every valuation model we threw at them. And they were great with quantitative stuff and all of that. But after two or three years, we had to send them back to business school to kind of round out who they were. And, and the commerce students, the UVA students that we had in after two or three years, we wanted to make them partners. Uh, and so I think that really goes to the heart of this notion of a well-rounded, liberally educated person. And, and that's, that's very, very important to who we are. I could just echo that briefly, that we've had exactly that same experience with the architecture school in comparison to other architecture schools. But just to come back for a moment to that issue about research really about framing the best questions or framing the right questions. There's the forms of research that take us into known territory and the kind of research that we're doing at a research university is when we're going beyond the known. And the, the questions, and the way we frame that and the kinds of questions we, we pose is far more often a function of a kind of critical thinking that is developed and understood through the liberal arts. It's not necessarily going to come out as the obvious question that comes out of looking at a body of research and saying, what do I not know? But through the kind of critical reasoning that one gains through the liberal arts, you pose better questions, do better research, and radically raise the opportunity to actually make a, a real difference in your research rather than just adding the next small increment of knowledge. So it really is at the heart of a research university rather than being something and maybe have different ways of critical thinking based on the, the different kinds of coursework or experiences yeah. you've had and bringing those together make you yeah. Yeah, more, the critical, the more combi critical. Yeah, the combination. Right. Well, yeah. I would like to, you know, I would just like to insert my little, oh, my little known factoid. Um, 
about our president, the first president of the University of Virginia in 1905 on the day he was inaugurated, um, signed an agreement um, to establish the Curry School of Education. John D. Rockefeller pledged $100,000, and that led to Peabody Hall, led to Ruffner, and to Bavaro today. And it was very much of a statement, I think, of our first president, of the value of education taking place within the context of the liberal arts. And Alderman always held firm to that principle who said that the teacher should be the educated teacher, not just trained for the profession. And I think that that's something that we have very much embraced currently for the last 20 years in the Curry School of Education because much as the other um, graduate schools do, we have now combined um, programs. And so our students earn both a master's degree from us and they earn a bachelor's degree from the college. And it really has enhanced, I think, our students enormously and again, as the dean said, when recruiters come and talk to us, they say they really value our students because our students have a perspective beyond that of simply um, immersing themselves in the education. I ask you. Well, I, I think it's also important to remember what is uh, distinctive about UVA. It's that we have the context of, of liberal arts education, but in the setting of a broader research university. You can get an excellent liberal arts education at many small arts colleges around the United States. So we have a different model, and that is, I think, what is special about UVA. Um, if you're at a liberal arts college, you may have wonderful teachers. There are many wonderful teachers at liberal arts colleges. Uh, and some of them do, in fact, conduct research. But in general, um, most of them are not at uh, the frontiers of their discipline. Most of them are not spending a lot of their time creating new knowledge. So there's a trade-off. When you're at a small liberal arts college, you may have, on average, smaller classes. There can be a level of intimacy that, frankly, sometimes can be hard to replicate at UVA as our enrollment grows. But, but I think what you gain by getting a liberal arts education in the conduct of a research university is worth it. People are busier here, but the place is brimming with excitement. The people that are teaching you your courses are the people that are shaping the debates in their fields. Um, the former Harvard dean, Henry Rudofsky, said that research is an expression of faith and the possibility of progress. And that is, I think, really what UVA is about. I mean, it's, it's what could be more generous than that? You said that he likes the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. At UVA, when you're learning liberal arts, you are surrounded by um, uh, scientists that are creating new discoveries, economists that are arguing cases on antitrust before the Supreme Court. You have to like that excitement. You have to thrive on it, and you have to find it. It's a bigger place. But a lot of the education occurs not just in the classroom, but all the activities that are going on on grounds. And so if you are the kind of student that will seek out those opportunities, you will have chances to learn about fields and discoveries that you would never get in a smaller place. But you have to be a much more active student, not just expect the education to come to you, but look around you and, uh, and find it. Those of you who showed up on this part of the brain meeting, clearly I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you have to be a different kind of student here than you have to be in Amherst. Uh, uh, but I think it's more exciting to be here. Let me just say just one thing. We, we hear the same kind of thing in the engineering schools, the Sears and Commerce and the Curry School, that recruiters like the fact that our students um, participate in education in the liberal arts too. It's almost like exercising different muscles. Your, your mental muscles to make you think differently about problems. And when you have all these different perspectives where you've been diving in with people at the, at the frontier of their field, and you go out, you see problems more holistically, and you, you can attack them um, and deal with other people in, in, a much, in a much more creative way. So I, I, I think I agree with you. I would sum it up as you can have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> Thank you. teaches you to think more broadly, to be open, to be flexible, to have an open mind, and experience things that you wouldn't necessarily have mapped out for yourself. And so you learn more about what it means to be a human being, and you learn more about what the world is that the human beings are living in, but at the same time you have this opportunity to participate in creating new knowledge and doing that kind of research that is adding to what that profile is. And so you can get that broad perspective and as well as, as challenge your brain to think critically in depth about something. 
Um, one of the most frustrating things Carrie mentioned that I, I, I do for second advising for Echo Scholars and one other students, and one of the most frustrating things I have is Echo Scholars tend to come in with very strong opinions about and ideas about what they want to do. And I think more than with any other student, I love talking to these students. It's exciting to have these conversations. But more than with any other students, I find myself repeating over and over again. In the biology department, most of the echo scholars assigned to me are science-directed um, students. Wouldn't you really like to take another course outside of the sciences? Yes, I know you're taking six courses, and I think you can handle that load, but maybe one non-science course would be really kind of interesting every now and then. And I warn them that this is what I will say every single semester. I feel very strongly about that. And it's, it's, it's your opportunity to experience this and to learn about all these other ways of thinking and feeling and experiencing without necessarily your being the one to do it. You can read about it. You can, you can learn about it from friends. You can learn about it from books. You can learn about it from all these different subjects. And it makes you a better person. Yet you have this opportunity to go in and really hurt your brain and you're thinking so hard about a research project. Great, thank you. <laughs> Moving on to our next question, uh, and I'm sure you guys have heard some some form of, of this question, or at least the beginning of this question. Uh, the events of this summer have inspired much debate regarding the educational reform. And um, you don't necessarily have to talk about all the gaps, um, but what are the gaps in um, liberal arts education? Um, what are the gaps? Uh, what gaps are there in educating students about research, and um, specifically, what would you change about UVA? Since then, we've been building universities globally more as a set of individual buildings separated where there's less opportunity for that kind of contact. So that is overcoming that, creating better opportunities for lateral networks, not to, in a way, um, in any way, destroy the disciplines, because that is where knowledge really advances in many ways, but in a way to let the cross-fertilization inform the disciplines in new ways and in a more robust way. So that's um, something, it's not so directly related to the summer because this, these uh, kinds of conversations have been going on uh, long before the summer. Um, and they're going on at every university in the, uh, in the country and probably around the world at this point. Because we understand the structures of knowledge in different ways than we did 100 years ago when our disciplines were formed. And we have to find new institutional models to um, create uh, the kind of 
tasks of educating students about research, I think sometimes we don't do a great job in uh, teaching you about the joys of stupidity. <laughs> so when, when we go into research, I always tell my students, whenever I draw an experiment on the whiteboard, it works every single time. But that isn't always the case when they go into the lab. And I think sometimes, sometimes the best students, students who have done the best in class, have the hardest time with the fact that, well, Kelly told me to do this, 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 I did all of it, and it didn't work. And then they come back and they think I'm going to be mad. I'm, I mean, I'm not mad at anybody, I'm mad at myself, but it's just part of the process. And I think with that acceptance of that lack of knowledge comes a tremendous amount of humility, which is, um, quite frankly, in generally in short supply in society these days. And so I think the, the more we can do that, tell students that when you're doing research, part of the Part of the process are all the mistakes that you make and all the dead ends you go down. That's part of the process. There is no research where you go and you start on one path and you just go right to the answer. That, that's not research. That's filling in the little dots that somebody else started drawing big, big lines. You want to be the one drawing big lines. But we also want to teach you to be the critical person to draw the big lines. Yeah. What exactly. I think I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know, the other, I agree with. Um, I'm very agreeable. Um, but, uh, but one of the things, I mean, in terms of, and this isn't just about UVA, this is about every place. I think that one of the challenges that we face is that the world, as we've already indicated, is a much more complex place and it's a much more dynamic place. And one of the things that bothers me about all universities, and we are uh, subject to some of the same constraints, is that we let things like um, CIS and semesters and things like that drive the way we organize ourselves and the way we actually handle um, the educational process. And, um, you know, I don't know, 14 years ago or something, we introduced a curriculum uh, in the third year of the common school where we basically blew up the, we, we still have to play within the rules of semesters and things like that and give grades and everything, but 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 we sort of blew up this that everything has to be a semester long course and it has to meet, you know, two or three days a week and all of that sort of stuff. And I think one of the real challenges going forward is, con is going to be to come up with much more flexible structures and processes and systems for courses in education that really allow for the dynamism and complexity and, and, and um, you know, Bill, you write about you know interdisciplinary stuff like that, but some of the exciting things I know that, that we've got faculty in the Cobb School that are doing J-term classes with the student or with uh, faculty from engineering, for example, and they're studying real problems in Argentina and things like that. That to me, and using you know a a different frame of reference for how a course is constructed, I think that's a real challenge for us that we need to tackle. I mean, I think it's I think it's really too bad that, for example, um, you know, study abroad typically is thought of as a semester long experience, and of course, every student says, "Oh, I want semester abroad," and then when you say, "Well, go take a semester abroad," they go, "Well, I don't want to leave Charlottesville," you know, <laughs> and and it's a big problem in the comp school because they're like, "We're only here two years, so we got to find a job," you know. So so I think that one of the gaps or problems or whatever you want to call it. Is that, is that we have to really rethink the educational structure and process to adapt to that new world. I, I want to piggyback on that because I completely agree. Uh, we created in the Batten School a program that's been very successful and accelerated master's of public policy program that allows yeah. students to begin a professional master's degree uh, before they receive the VA. This has been a program that is really responsive to student needs uh, as well as for their demands. It's a very diverse toolkit that students are getting in economics and politics and statistics and analysis. We've been placing students extremely well. But we had to design the program around a set of existing rules mm -hmm. that did not contemplate such a program. And therefore, even though the program is working very well, it's the design elements it's clunky. For example, you know, in the in the students' fourth year, students are spending a lot of their courses with us, but they can't be officially classified as bad students because 
they can't be listed as in our program until they receive a good grade. Well, the reality is they're, they're not math students. They're math students and college students. They're math students and yes. engineering students. Yeah. And the, the state systems do not yet recognize that the world is, is dynamic. Mm -hmm. And we need some flexibility to come up with, with better programs. And so right now, I think faculty are pushing against a system that is not always as pliable as it should be. And that can be discouraging. And it can leave faculty to throw up their hands and give up because they find out about uh, all the documentation that's necessary or all the MOUs, <laughs> as opposed to sitting down and saying, if we're going to design a fresh, what a first-rate program would be, what would it look like? So, uh, you know, I think faculty, we need to work harder, and we need to work with the administration. We need students to, to be persistent and say, you know, don't tell me about the bureaucratic rules. Let's figure out how to make this work. Um, but we, so we need a spirit of entrepreneurship, I think, and, uh, and a willingness to challenge some of the existing conventions because they, they're dusty and crusty in their time to, 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 to get, in, get with the 21st century. is a kind of uh, ivory tower separate from the world is really gone. And, 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 but most of, many of our structures and rules still reflect that model. And you know, another way of thinking about it is that there's these vast networks of information, resources, knowledge, expertise, and we're a kind of intensification of that. But there isn't a hard line or a boundary anymore between what constitutes the university and what constitutes all these relationships with the world. And that's a really exciting moment and a really exciting way to be thinking bringing the structures in line, but realizing that is uh, one of our real But yet, you know, we're all still bounded by certain state requirements, you know, and things such as this. So we still have to answer to licensing agencies because we need to provide the education that our students need and require. So we're, we're having the same conversations in the current school now, particularly expanding the use of summer school. I don't know, I'm not familiar with how much you all do in the summer terms, but that's been something that talk about more and more, and also making more use of the J-term, which I think is something we have to talk about. I, I have a solution for dealing with some of the state uh, limitations that are placed on us.
second, I actually had some talent in science because I took biology as a science requirement, as part of one of those area requirement types of things. Uh, I struggled with this for a long time because I fought it. I fought it hard. I thought, I could do this. I love reading this. I love learning about the history behind it. I love all of this. But, you know, sometimes you just got to face facts. And it was, I'm sure, going to give me an ulcer if I pursued that line uh, any further. So I was a double major for a number of years and then finally converted German to a minor so that I had more time for the science courses that I needed to along with all the other courses. Um, I, I didn't know what I was best at and what I had the most excitement to do going in with the limited experience I had in high school. Now most of you come to college with a lot more opportunities for a variety of subjects to be exposed to in high school than we did back in the day when you took English, basic sciences, basic math, history, a language, that was pretty much it. Right on stone tablets. You had stone tablets? Yeah, you know, psychology <laughs> and economics and all of these other subjects that they were not part of the, the standard secondary school education. So you have a little bit more opportunity to be exposed to that. But this place is phenomenal in giving you opportunities to see subjects and think in ways that you just couldn't possibly have fathomed coming in here with your experience today. You need to take advantage of that. Uh, I wish that everybody would voluntarily take advantage of that. Would I have? Probably to some extent, maybe not as much as I, I did because I had to. And so I think as educators, we, we then have to draw the line and say, all right, it's for your good, we're going to have this. I like the area requirements. I'm not so keen on the way they're often fulfilled and how they're still kind of restrictive in what students expose themselves to, but I like the idea of it. I love that concept of giving you the encouragement to try subjects and, and disciplines that you haven't thought about before. Just reading. I, I, I want to take some of these courses. I, I couldn't read the titles. I start at A and insist and go through and read the titles of courses. It's amazing what we teach at this place. So that's what you need to do. And, and I think the area requirements are really expressing that. We're in the process of talking about curriculum revision in the college, and this is one of those important questions that's going to be addressed. So we want to keep these, if not, what do we replace them with, if not, so on. And you should have a you should have a say in this based on what your own experiences are, but I think you ought to think about it. And another aspect of that, by the way, are the USIMs, which I think are a wonderful offering for EBA. Have any of you taken the USIM? I mean, the diversity of topics and titles. I mean, you know, I'd like to sit in on all of them. Just add that It's true, the J turns and uh -huh. a lot of these. A lot of these. And, and so that goes back. A lot of the more interesting stuff is not taught in the traditional right. structure. Right. right. And, uh, you know, thinking about the two-thirds of the departments here represent disciplines that are not taught in high schools, and so it's yeah. at least. And so it's that process of discovery. In the architecture school, it's the, the you know, great student who comes in but then discovers anthropology because they you know, didn't know about it really. Right. It's a, it's, that's a fantastic thing, and, that's, and to be able to have the flexibility. And in some ways, the area requirements are a slightly clunky structure, but they serve a really useful purpose in opening up those perspectives. From the one of the questions on here was about should engineering students be required to take more liberal arts courses, and I think in in general, um, I and most of my colleagues would say yes. The, and back maybe a dozen years ago or so, um, they were required to take more, but uh, at that point, to get an engineering degree here, you needed to take on average 135 credits, and so um, Chev didn't think that was such a great idea, so they said the most you can have is 128. So um, we did a number of things like classes that were five credits, four magically became four credits. Didn't change the requirement. But one of the things that were lost was some of the uh, some of the liberal arts requirements, and, and that was um, that was too bad. It was, it was a problem. I think in terms of ten pounds into a five pound bag. The other thing you need to take care of it is wonderful with students coming with AP credits. I mean, I certainly applaud that, and I think it's wonderful your accomplishments. But sometimes I worry that students who have as many, they will present with as much of a semester's worth of AP credits. You shouldn't 
So you yeah. so can really follow the things that they are really passionate about. And sometimes I think we see students, they have a lot of AP credits in math or something, and I say, great, go now take some real math. <laughs> you're, not, not, you're not done. Now you have the chance to actually learn some math. And too many times I think students view AP credits as checking a box and things they don't have to do as opposed to giving them the opportunity to really advance and to distinguish themselves. And uh, AP credits should be viewed as placement, not as mm -hmm. something to get you out of, uh, of learning. Uh, and so we need to look at AP credits a little differently than these students do. Great. Go ahead and move on to the next question. UVA has a number of excellent interdisciplinary programs, and you guys have already been talking about interdisciplinary, um, the inter interdisciplinary nature of many of our, our programs. Um, how, if at all, do these programs encourage or discourage um, the marriage of liberal arts and research at UVA? I'll jump in on that one. Just a really short comment. And it's not so much that I think the liberal arts versus research are to sort of that, that dichotomy, but there are very different cultures. that are not always easily bridged. And one of the challenges in putting together a multidisciplinary program to bring together fields that essentially speak different languages is actually finding that common language or framing the common question that forces a, a kind of uh, search for a common language. And that's, again, when they get very interesting, but it's also very difficult. Um, and it requires harder work on everybody's part is to be able to, uh, to bridge those. So I think there is a reason why often interdisciplinary programs are in sort of shades of difference rather than fundamentally uh, distinct disciplines. But they, there are also huge opportunities, and we are seeing more of them, frankly, where the arts and the sciences are working together uh, in many ways uh, where we're encouraging uh, research that straddles boundaries. Um, but, it, but it is actually overcoming a hurdle that's sort of intrinsic in the nature of discipline and finding a common culture is as difficult within academic spheres as it is within all spheres of life, um, and it requires um, additional effort, but it's worth it. You need a guide <coughs> to some extent. You know, Somebody this has to like, This is what the advising comes in. But I was just going to say, I was thinking about that. I was asked to be a critic in the, um, on an architectural jury. Mm -hmm. Imagine it last fall. And I had a sense of walking in and sort of feeling uneasy and sort of slightly dizzy as I was listening students present their projects and asking me questions I had been given a designated role as a client in this particular project. And it was really interesting what you say, Bill, is that this is a totally different, I'm used to my students in the current school, and I know how they respond, but architecture students were a lot different. Mm -hmm. and it, so from a faculty perspective, I can also say shifting boundaries. But in the end, that them having to translate, it goes back yeah. to the earlier comments about being able to actually speak clearly to someone who's not part of the discourse actually makes the questions clear, but it also allows one, one of the great challenges we have as an institution is being able to speak to a broader public in a way that actually um, articulates the value of what we do. And if we only talk to each other and we don't engage other languages, it's, uh, we have a really tough time with that. Yeah, and you know, I would say that one of the opportunities that we have at UVA is that the responsibility for that dialogue and conversation is not just on the faculty, but it's really on the students as well. And one of the one of the exciting we we uh, about five or six years ago started a, a fifth year MS in Commerce program, and you're not allowed to be a commerce student or a business graduate to be in the program. You've got to come from someplace, some other discipline, some other major, and um, and the conversations in those classrooms are very different. Even though they're taking the same course, they're basically, they're very different than the, than the conversations we often have even in the undergraduate program. Um, because the students have, have spent four years um, in another discipline and probably two or three years in another major and uh, with a minor. Um, and, uh, and so they come into the classroom and they take the conversations in directions that our faculty kind of come out and they go, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. And that's great. Um, frankly, it's, 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 as long as you get through the material, obviously, it's fun for the professor because you go in, in, in really interesting ways. And I've, uh, you know, I've, I've taught in that program some and, and gone international uh, on, on uh, courses.
course trips with these students. And boy, you know, I'll be standing there, and, and one was an architecture student, and you know, we were uh, we were in Asia looking at something, and I got a discourse on Asian architecture <laughs> from this student. It was it was impressive, and I was like, wow. You know. So so I think students have a responsibility to play in that as well, and I would encourage that to be something that you really take seriously. We might also do another one, but we'll um, see how this one plays out. This is probably the broadest question of all of them, and um, kind of the tone of, of the event. Uh, liberal arts and research are often portrayed as opposing players in higher education. What is your personal perspective on the role of liberal arts education at a research institution, and what do you think is the state of arts of liberal arts at our institution? Well, I was talking to a, a friend, uh, Ben Lugowski, writer about higher education policy, and I was mentioning I was going to be on this panel, and he reminded me, uh, this is before all of your times, so of my colleagues on the panel may remember, a Saturday Night Live skit from the 1970s, and it was a, pro it was a product, it was a, like a, a commercial, and it was called, uh, I think it was called uh, New Shimmer, okay, and uh, people said, New Shimmer, it's a floor wax, and another person says, no, New Shimmer, it's a dessert topping. I said, you crazy, New Shimmer is a floor wax. No, it's a dessert topping. And then another person that says, New Shimmer is both a floor wax and a dessert topping. <laughs> and of course, that's what our research universities are. We are promoting here. <laughs> we're promoting the life, the life of the mind, and research is the engine of economic growth and discovery. And those two spheres together, the, the sphere of, of contemplation and reflection and the search for deeper meaning and also the problem solving, the creation, the experimentation, both of those things together are what make, I think, a place like UVA so, so special. Um, and that is really, uh, uh, in some ways, the defining characteristic of a university like UVA. The fact that we have students who are studying English and engineering in the same space, the same grounds, and that we think the two complement one another. Now, I think it is a challenge to figure out how do you keep those synergies vibrant and relevant and thriving in a world where things are changing, where the demands of external stakeholders are changing, where students, as they are paying a higher share of their education, uh, are naturally asking what are they going to get out of their degrees, and parents are asking for that. Those are all, I think, very very reasonable questions. Uh, and so, you know, part of, I think, what we have to do is, is to be honest with students, first of all. And students who come into UVA who want to study the liberal arts need to know what they're, what they're beginning. What is the nature of the journey? The first thing that people have to keep in mind is that the most important justification for a liberal arts education, I think, was, is, and always will be that it strengthens the mind and makes life richer and more meaningful. That is the primary justification for why you're here, for, to study liberal arts. Now, liberal arts also teaches a lot of things that are very useful for professional success. Communication, critical thinking, um, uh, hopefully the ability to do research and answer a question, a skepticism, the desire for evidence, the ability to frame an argument and make persuasive contribution to debates. All those things are true, but those are general skills. And um, they transition to the workforce. But what I think some of the anxiety that we're seeing from students today is they want to know, how do I translate those skills specifically to particular jobs, right? Um, and that is a totally reasonable and fair question. And I think the university needs to do an even better job helping students make that transition. Part of it, I think, is on students themselves have a responsibility, and part of it is on the university and the faculty to help students. Students need, I think, to take responsibility to realize when you come out of the University of Virginia with a degree in a particular subject and it's not accounting or not engineering, you are going to be an extremely broad and well-educated person who is going to be the kind of person who has the ability and talent to succeed in a variety of but what particular field do you enter if you don't want to go to graduate school? You know, you're not headed to 
bar medicine or business or something else, is going to, education, public administration, is going to depend on how you build on your general knowledge. What particular internships did you do? What was your research project? What, where did you travel? Who did you meet? What's your passion? And, and students have to begin developing a little bit of a portfolio of their passion and their interest that when you combine that with your general knowledge, I think is, is very powerful. But a lot of students, I think, sometimes are passive and they only come in and they just take courses, they take wonderful courses, but they haven't actively used their time here to figure out how they're gonna supplement their wonderful foundation of arts education with the other kinds of strengths that are gonna help them move along in their, in their career. So part of it, I think, is the university could do a better job in recognizing the job market has changed and that students need, to, need that assistance, but students themselves need to be mindful of all the opportunities while they're here to build on and not just passively take classes, but to come out with a story of what did you do while you were at TDA? What did you read? What did you learn? What, what is your passion? Where, where are you going? And when students do that, they can go anywhere and they do go anywhere. But um, that's part of the process, I think, of being a liberal arts student in the 21st century. So does it go back to um, it usually does. <laughs> <laughs> I think somehow it all does. I, I, I think you put that really beautifully in, in how, you, how you express that. And I would pull out one specific thing that you had said at the very beginning that I'd love to build on. Because so much of the kind of larger cultural pressures are based on perhaps models of the way we engage the world through both consumption and production. You know, we're sort of expected to be producing constantly. students to work for you. We are educating students to replace you. <laughs> so, they changed the tone of the rest of the visit and uh, very much for the better. And, uh, and that in a way is part of that liberal arts mission is to be able to do things better in the future. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that just to, well, maybe now I'll put it in my language, um, that, you know, there's just so many people out there and unfortunately a lot of them reside in Richmond. Uh, who, who view a university education as a short-term transaction as opposed to, you know, a, a long-term process. And, you know, the, to me, the, the, uh, a college education, um, and I don't care what you major in, uh, should, should be, you know, a first, granted, big step in that process. And, and granted, we, we understand as, as well as you do that, that somewhere along the line you feel like you need some skills to kind of break into a job market somehow and start to, you know, um, you know, have a career or make a living or whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> and we have to balance that. We have to figure out how to do that. But, but your mindset should be, I'm really getting rolling in this process as a, as a 18 to 22 year old. And, and that's really what you want to be doing. And because there are gonna, you're all going to, I mean, what do the statistics show? You're all going to live to be 125 years old. And, <laughs> and uh, you're going to have, you know, 19 careers and, you know, all this sort of stuff. Well, if you, if you actually do that,
if you think about it that way, I think it's a really healthy way to think about it. Um, you have to be living the reality of the moment too. But but I think as a, as a mindset to approach it, that's a really good way good way to think about it. Would anyone else like to say anything? <coughs> All right, so that will conclude our, our, uh, our questions for you. Um, now we will uh, turn to um, those who came out uh, to ask questions, and um, I'd encourage you to, you know, if you have a question that isn't necessarily tied exactly to what we've been discussing, um, but is, you know, at least far off related, ask it, um, and I'm, I know that they would be um, happy to answer it. So we will do this for about another 15 minutes, and then um, we will we will conclude. So do, does anyone have any questions? And if you do, you can you can just shout out. I think they should be able to hear you. Yep. Relevant to what you've all just been talking about, um, Professor Elzinga last semester gave advice that now in this economy uh, you need to specialize. I mean, he said that um, uh, he gave the quote, uh, "Jack of all trades, master of none." And, and I've gone out and I've talked to people out in the workforce, and, and they told me. Specialize, you need to specialize. And so I, I just, I guess I wonder, hey, should that start here, or at what point should this kind of specialization start? Because um, I, I feel like when I get a liberal arts education, I really, in, in a way, in a sense, not, not all trades, but you know, jack of all trades, I'm, I'm learning so many diverse fields. And I know uh, my fellow students feel the same. So I guess my question is kind of at what point is that um, kind of specialization? So you can't really get away with being the jack of all trades with 120 credit hours of serendipity. You have to somehow focus and get into some depth. So, so we do require that you start specializing. Um, and I think the question is not so much how um, of whether you specialize or not, but that that's not the only thing you do mm -hmm. here. That you fill that out the rest of that time out. That you don't spend all 120 credit hours on the biology major or the economics major or the philosophy major, but you do uh, what you need to to get comfortable with that discipline to be able to start thinking creatively in it and analytically in it, but then you fill out the rest of those 120 credit hours with that breadth of the liberal arts that gives you more experience than you can have on your own. Just to add to that, one thing is that concept of specialization doesn't necessarily mean a predetermined disciplinary specialization. And this comes back to what you were saying earlier, that you, the combination of things that you put together here gives you a very distinct and special perspective and unique perspective on that body of knowledge. And to be able to articulate that, to be able to pull that together, as we were hearing earlier, is a way of, of saying the same without thinking of it meaning that I have to go into this sub sub specialty into this specific domain of knowledge that in order to fulfill that. Um, it really has to do with how you tell the story of the way you understand the world through the experience that you uh, gather. Yeah, and it has to do with strategic thinking skills, I think is what we're all trying to say. So, you know, the different disciplines, sure, so you are a jack of all trades briefly, um, but then you need to sort of pour into that basket and that's where you go on with your focus. But I think if you have the exposure to what it means to be an architect, what it means to be an engineer, what it means to be a scientist, what it means to be a teacher, what it means to be a school, uh, a, a leader in policy, you know, you get you're, you're get you're getting all of these things in your basket and then you put them together and then you do go up. You are a master of thinking. I think what you become is a master of your passion. And whether that fits inside electrical engineering or not, and I think in the 21st century is, is nominally irrelevant. It's you have, one of your jobs while you're here is to find out what it is that you would do for free for the rest of your life. And if you find that, the greatest thing about the 21st century, somebody will pay you to do it. <laughs> so I think that's where the specialization 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's that's right. And I think, again, that goes back to this notion. I mean, I, again, living in the real world, I would agree that probably um, that particularly for some entrance level requirements, you have to have some specialization. And, and a way I think about it is you got to have some sort of, you know, uh, hardcore skills that you can kind of use to do that. But, but the fact of the matter is that if you really look at it, that there's not... Um, you know, that, that hurdle isn't very high. And the fact is that those specialization skills will get you in the door and it's the other stuff that's going to make you successful. And, and the higher you get up, and I don't care whether it's in a government organization, an architecture firm, a high school, or a business, the higher you get up, the less those, those things become more important. Now, you've got to speak the language and be able to read a balance sheet or read a bill in Congress or whatever. No, but I mean, it, it's absolutely, it's absolutely the case. And so, I, I don't agree with that, that I'll specialize, you know, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's again, that's that short-term transaction way of thinking. And I mean, that's exactly, believe it or not, that's what we fight in the, in the comm school all the time. That's why, you know, a concentration in the comm school is three courses. Three courses. And we, and we say to, you know, banks, hey, this guy's ready to go. You know, I mean, and, and they're successful. I think that they are, that there are opportunities, but to be critical, I think we can do a better job. Yeah. I think we've been talking for the last hour, and one of the themes is that one of the great strengths of UVA is the connection between research and liberal arts education, the undergraduate level. But we could, and I think it, it needs to be the faculty, do a better job of creating those opportunities and those structures. There are faculty members working on particular research projects and not make it ad hoc, but have as a regular process, bring undergraduates and graduate students into process of research is a regular part of our activity. Right now, faculty members, uh, some do it and many don't. We, we haven't been uh, strongly encouraged. There are the mechanisms to sort of say, as part of what you do in your research, you need to connect with undergraduates, find a piece of that project that is really appropriate. We have phenomenally bright undergraduates here. They're passionate. They want to do things. Let's find uh, programs and systems to make that happen as a regular part of what we do. And I think and I think that is an area that research universities over the next 10, 20 years really can be much more innovative on. And, and, I, and I hope that's one that, that we work on. Because I think we have opportunities now for undergraduate research, but uh, it is definitely, it's our sweet spot, and we should be doing even more with it, I think. As I said earlier, I think the JPC grants and the CBER grants, and there are more and more initiatives that are coming out of the Provost Office. But again, it's just, it's hard for some faculty if they don't have external funding to ask a student to work for X number of hours to code data or something like that, or to transcribe the data. And so it's kind of, um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sticky wicket sometimes, I think. There's, um, in a way, there are often more opportunities in the sciences because they tend to be, and in engineering, they tend to be on working on funded, larger research yeah. teams that have room to bring undergraduates um, in. That is not the case in the questions is, does it happen as a kind of an, an overload on top of all of your curricular duties, or does it get woven directly into the curriculum? And there's universities that go through these debates, we've seen it happen within architecture schools, do we have a kind of a thesis or an engineering a capstone project or a, a project that expects a level of original research by the student by the time they graduate? Once you ask that question, and or pose that as a goal, it has a ripple effect all the way back through the curriculum because for the first year you have to be preparing that student to succeed at that point. And so that is perhaps the, um, the more extreme model of research is in the core of the curriculum and the curriculum is geared to prepare you for a very successful um, research experience by the time you graduate. The other is that, the other model is that there are a series of research opportunities that are over or at the, the kind of margins of the curriculum. And I think the, and my own view is that increasingly we are going to be moving naturally, whether we're doing that in the UK, toward the integral research model because that's where you get at the kinds of 
skills that can carry you through a dynamic and changing world in life. Not just simply the completion of a set of requirements for a degree, but having gone through the experience of adding to the discipline in some way, adding to the larger body of knowledge through your, the core of your education. Um, and that's something that may be expanding in terms of opportunities in the future here in many places. And I should say, um, at, at the Baton School, we haven't next year, but our new undergraduate major in public policy and, and leadership has as part of its requirement a capstone team research project. And that will be on a particular policy issue and there will be multiple teams doing original research. So I'm very excited about that and, and I hope that it will be successful. I think it will be successful and perhaps that will, will spread.
ascertain from the research seminar as part of the interview what kind of a teacher that individual would be. But it's a totally different kind of presentation. And so it often is not, I think, is not completely predictive. Uh, I want to move your question a little bit past that and assuming that we're all trying to hire people that we think are going to take the teaching job seriously and be effective teachers. Um, I, I'm going to be a little bit critical here because it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I don't think that the institution, as an institution, and that, this is a generalization, but I don't think the institution as a whole um, offers sufficient rewards for innovative development of pedagogies that are going to take the take us to the next level of really reaching each and every one of the students. There's a lot of literature out there, there's a lot of pedagogy, and there's not much reward for taking the extra time, energy, and quite frankly, anxiety at introducing new activities into the classroom and into the background and into the design of courses, uh, because it's not the primary What's, reviewed, what's regarded as the primary responsibility of the faculty member, which is the research excellence. Uh, in, in my ideal world, I would put them on equal plane, and that just isn't the case. I that, would say that varies by department. I, I, I said it was a generalization. Yeah, um, but I, I'm speaking. Uh, I'm the college person here, and, and I think in general that's um, although we all we all know that the institution values good teaching, um, there's not a lot of incentive for the individual who doesn't have the intrinsic gratification that comes from developing and pushing the limits on the teaching. In the Baptist School, we've, we've grown a lot in the last few years. We're a new school, and, and we do. We require our job candidates, in addition to giving a recent talk, to also do a class, essentially, for students. And it's been quite interesting uh, because uh, there have been times when, when what happens in that, in that setting has affected our deliberations. And we've ended up uh, on several occasions not hiring somebody simply because we thought that the teaching was not going to be strong enough. And so it's time consuming. Uh, it makes our hiring process a little bit more, more complicated. But for us, it's really been, it's worked very well, I think. And it, and it, it integrates students into the valuation of new faculty members, uh, and it also sends a signal to uh, our prospective hires, if you come to the Baton School, we value teaching. Um, and um, so I've been very excited about that as, as part of our evaluation of how we decide to get to be a faculty member in our school. Um, so a common complaint that I've been hearing throughout this discussion is that um, students tend to come in kind of narrow-minded. Um, Professor Carmiller, you talked a little bit about how high school curricula now these days are different from the past and that we have a greater variety of courses that we can take, yet you still see kind of this emphasis on AP um, kind of replacing credits. You still see, um, you know, schools such as, uh, especially schools such as Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology popping up. You still see that first year Echo Scholar coming in with a very um, kind of limited idea of what she wants to do. Um, so my question is, do you, you, what is kind of a way that you would reform or maybe enhance lower levels of education to kind of nurture that open-mindedness, that kind of liberal, liberal arts mindset prior to the transition to college? I was stumped. <laughs> I, I think you're talking about addressing a huge educational system that's not, you know, going to able to respond perhaps the way we would like to necessarily have it, but that doesn't mean that we can give up on the attitude of the requirement mind. You know, there's two things at play. There are the requirements and there are the reality of the tests, but there's still the attitude of the mind, I think is perhaps what we're saying. Is that I think we have enough trouble figuring out what we're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of <laughs> I guess no, it does no, have to be more like an idealistic. Yeah. Kind of thing. No, no, it is a huge challenge to create a system yeah. that actually is about following the rules, doing what you're told, getting the A's, getting, taking the tests, doing all the tests. And I've got one daughter here and a son in high school, so I'm watching it all happen in real time. 
um, that leads to a certain mindset about how you accomplish. And that is a very tough thing to change, and it would be a long-term cultural change that, probably, that I think will happen, um, that something will change in that sphere. It raises a really interesting question for us as a university, particularly in the first year, of how do we actually facilitate that transition in a more profound and powerful way so that students recognize that their questions are different now. Um, you didn't have room to fail in high school. You should have room to fail in college. If you, um, you should have room in high school either, but no, I mean, also, but, not a, but we don't have a system that really allows that. There has to be a, a different way that one is encouraged to take risks. There has to be, and this is where the earlier discussion of expanding the boundaries of what one's exposed to very much in the first year. There are many ways that universities do that. Some do it through a kind of common great books reading um, at the beginning through orientation. Some of them do, do it through a set of first year requirements. They use some, um, open that up here in some ways. Um, but that's something that there actually could be a lot more focus on in how we make, help make that transition to a system that I think none of us are particularly happy with, but that we're bound to. I think secondary schools could take, in my ideal world, could take, um, make a transition to, instead of teaching by discipline, teaching by big questions. So that uh, you solve a problem by bringing math to it, by bringing biology to it, by bringing economics to it, by bringing anthropology to it, where you start to, to help students learn and use all parts of the brain and from different angles, so that you're not locked into that I'm memorizing chemical formulas today, and I'm memorizing classifications of animals tomorrow, and I'm memorizing um, names and definitions the next day. And so I think it's set up, you come based from what you're given, and the secondary education is built on those disciplines that are as narrowly defined, more narrowly defined than they are even here. So I think broadening that, if you had a whole day, for example, with four teachers in your classroom, and from, who had specialties in different areas, and you were trying to you know, build a bigger whatever, or fix some ecological problem, or something. We had to bring so many different subjects to bear and get students to help brainstorm and constantly be thinking about all these different subjects at the same time. That's amazing learning. That's something that you, you never lose. You never lose that kind of analytical process and you can always go to the internet and look up the definitions if you forget them years later, but you haven't lost that sense of integration and outreach to, to all the different ways of thinking. And I think if, if anything would help us do our jobs more, it would be broadening what you think of as a discipline that no longer exists. But I don't see that happen because there are so many more regulations on the <laughs> secondary schools yes. more than we have even. So. <laughs> take the last question now. Go ahead. Thank you so much for your time, Kimberly. This has been a great discussion and a great dialogue. Um, and a few of us came in late from a student council meeting, so I apologize if we've already touched on this. But something we champion in student council is our Speak Up UVA website. And one of the top rated posts on that website recently has been this um, frustration with enrollment for students among different colleges, among different schools. So I didn't know if there were, like, what the discussion was from a departmental, from a leadership standpoint um, on trying to improve this issue for students. There, I know I've personally talked to a lot of, like, nursing students who really want to take college courses but can't get into them, and commerce students who would really benefit from taking a couple of courses in the engineering school but haven't had the opportunity to do so because they can't enroll in those courses. So is there something, I guess, practically that is going on to try to address this, or is there something students can do to try to petition and raise some more awareness on this issue? Well, I mean, <coughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think first of all, there are efforts underway to try to create um, both, you know, credit and non-credit experiences for students to achieve that end. And, and we've got to be better about it. And we've got to find ways to um, make that happen so that
commerce and engineering students are sitting in a classroom talking about or wherever they're sitting. Uh, at the, they would be down at, uh, at Bill's shop, but but talking about you know uh, an entrepreneurial idea or whatever it happens to be. You know the fundamental problem with a lot of this is we just don't have the resources, and and we can all sit around and talk about the philosophical issues here, but at the end of the day, it comes down to. I mean, one of the big reasons to go back to a previous question that, that it, it's sometimes hard probably to get faculty members to engage, you know, a significant number of undergraduates in research is they're stretched thin. And, and it's a bandwidth issue. And, and this goes back to, to what I alluded to earlier, that if we don't come up with a much better mechanism to um, create uh, resources, to bring resources into the university, then we all, we can solve a lot of these problems, but but it comes back to uh, a broken, uh, it, it's a broken business model, it's a broken funding model, and unless we come to grips with that and we are serious about doing something about it, this these problems are just going to, you know, we'll put band-aids on them and we'll come up with a course and we'll do some things like that. We got to make, fix the big issues. As far as what can students do, it, it's easy. You raise hell. <laughs> that, that's yeah, but, but it. But again, it's, you don't want to rate the, the faculty. Believe in these things too. Yeah. And you know, I believe in these things. You can come in and yell at me for <laughs> for saying uh, you know a college student can't take one of our core courses in the comm school. Well, there's a reason. I don't have any space. I don't have any faculty to do it. You have to direct it. So, but my, my point is that, that it's, it, is, it is a, it's a real issue and, and it, it has to be dealt with uh, or else I, I really, I worry about the long term. And that's a, and it's, it's not an internal institution issue. No. Again, it's a broader societal yeah. issue. We yeah. are disinvesting in almost all public resources, whether they're infrastructure or universities, for decades. We're feeling the effects, and so that's where students can raise their voice um, and make it clear that it isn't enough to be disinvesting at the rate that we've been doing as a society. And that is a, a, a great opportunity for getting beyond the university to uh, provide the resources and, and to, uh, in a way, even before the resources, is to actually articulate the value means to a larger yeah. society. Mm -hmm. The resources follow our values, mm -hmm. and so it's not about give us more money, it's about what are we doing for at least a society value, and what would be the loss if we continue on the path that we've been on, been on for a number of decades. And if it, it goes back to the K-12 issue as well. It, if you look at countries where they have said, you know, we're really going to make a difference here, and they make education a priority, you can change that. You know, where all of a sudden teachers, and, and, and it could be a kindergarten teacher, again, as much as a chair professor, you know, those the, those people, you know, are really uh, valued, and I don't mean just in compensation, but I mean, you know, that, that people invest in their training and their development, and they're, they're not stretched to a point where they can't do a research project with a student, whatever it happens to be, and unfortunately, you know, this country, the, the, one of the pillars that, that made this country great was the commitment to, to education. And we are in the process right now of disassembling an educational system that, frankly, much of the world now is trying to copy because it was so successful. 